Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session three of the sixth International Conference on Big Data for Official Statistics. This session is entitled Using Big Data for SDGs, Mobile Data for Tourism, Migration, Population, and Transport. My name is Esperanza Magpantay. I'm the senior statistician from the International Telecommunication Union, the UN Specialized Agency for Telecommunication and ICTs. I will be moderating this session. Before I ask our presenters, I have some housekeeping announcements. We will have this session until around uh, 6.30 Korean time with an hour and a half uh, duration. We have four distinguished speakers with us today. And I will ask the first two speakers to do their presentations and then it will be followed by a Q&A. Participants are requested to post their questions in their live chat. Uh, and then we will have our moderators read the questions after the two speakers. So to start, I am very happy and privileged to moderate this session and to represent one of the task teams of the Global Working Group on Big Data, the task team on mobile phone big data, which I am currently leading. As you are all aware, the availability of mobile, mobile phones is very pervasive in all parts of the world, as well as the data that is generated or are generated from the use of mobile phones. There's a lot of expectation from this data, which is always tagged as an alternative or new data source to fill data gaps that are necessary for monitoring the progress towards the achievements of the sustainable development goals. It is therefore important that the methods related to the production of these statistics derived from the mobile phone data are harmonized and standardized. To this end, the task team on mobile phone data has been working since the inception of the global working group and since last year has been very active. Thanks to the joint efforts of several experts who are part of the working group. We have members that are coming from international organizations, national or countries, academia, private agencies, researchers, as well as experts that are working on mobile phone data in different areas of statistics. The task team is currently now comprised of around 50 indiv individual experts and members, each bringing their own expertise and experiences. Recognizing the different areas where mobile phone data can be used, we formed six subgroups in the task team, in the mobile task team, to work on areas such as tourism statistics, which is currently led by DPS Indonesia. We also have a subgroup on migration statistics, currently led by Geostat uh, Georgia. We also have a, a subgroup on census and dynamic population, currently being led by Flowminder, as well as transport and commuting statistics, currently being led by the World Bank, uh, and on information society statistics, which is currently led by yours truly and the ITU. We also have the last subgroup on the displacement in this third context, which is currently led by the University of Tokyo. So one of the themes of this conference is on the use of mobile big data and how big data can support the monitoring of the progress towards the SDGs. The work of these subgroups uh, on defining the methodologies and standards and how to produce the statistics that are coming from the mobile phone data is very important. For example, the work that ITU leads on uh, looking at mobile phone data to derive statistics, particularly on the three SDG indicators. For example, the percentage of population using the internet, the percentage of population that has um, access to mobile networks or mobile signal, and the percentage of the population who owns the mobile phone. We hope that we will be able to help countries, NSOs particularly, and other data providers to calculate the indicators that will be useful 
in monitoring the progress towards the SDGs. This is a very timely initiative and a necessary work at the time when we are in. Data collection, for example, in countries is being halted because of the, the situation that we are in with this COVID-19. All of this will be highlighted in the presentations by our distinguished speakers. All of them will highlight the ongoing work that is happening in the different subgroups and will showcase the use of mobile phone data in the different countries where they are operating. So without further ado, I would like to start our session today. I would like to invite Mr. Dong Ok Lee, who is the head of IoT and data department of SK Telecom. Mr. Lee is the person in charge of creating demographic data such as floating population data using mobile phone at SK Telecom, which is the mobile telecommunications operator with the largest market share in Korea. So Mr. Lee, I would like to invite our uh, colleagues from uh, Korea to play his uh, presentation. So I will introduce now. Titi. So Titi is the director of Finance, Information, Technology, and Tourism Statistics from BPS Indonesia. She is responsible to manage data collection, processing, and analysis of finance, information, technology, and tourism statistics at BPS Indonesia. So if we can play the presentation of TT while uh, the presentation of Mr. Lee is being fixed, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the chair. So my presentation today is using big data for SDGs. I will say, tell about the use of mobile data for tourism and commuting in Indonesia. A background, in Indonesia, the SDGs target have been set up to achieve the 2013 agenda there are uh, about 390 indicators and BPS Statistics Indonesia contributes to 136 Indo Indonesian SDGs indicators. Um, actually, there are data gaps in terms of coverage, granularity, subnational data we didn't some we didn't have, and then frequency and timeliness. That is why mobile positioning data is used to fill in the gaps. how we fill the gaps with mobile processing data. Like uh, in target 8.9, by the 2013 de device and implement policies to promote sustainable tourism that creates jobs and promote local culture and products. Immigration data is available for official gates. So we use uh, for inbound and outbound tourism. However, uh, mobile processing data is used to increase uh, coverage to get data for unofficial gates. And also, uh, we use uh, mobile positioning data to obtain granularity for tourism, uh, domestic, for tourist, uh, domestic tourism. While in target 12B, by the 2013, develop and implement tools to monitor sustainable development impact for sustainable tourism that create jobs and promote local culture and products. Since uh, there is no departure, uh, rifle and departure card anymore since 2015, so we use mobile positioning data for subnational data for tourism, inbound or domestic and outbound statistics. In target 10.7, uh, facilitate orderly, safe, regular and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through the implementation of plan and well-managed immigration policies. We have a household survey, which is only conducted every two years and not in all municipalities, only a few municipalities, about uh, 10 or 15. And mobile processing data is used for 
commuting and internal regulation to obtain monthly and in all municipalities. In target 11.B, support positive economic, social, and environmental links between urban, or urban and rural areas by strengthening national and regional development planning. So now data, we use uh, mobile positioning data for commuting and metropolitan statistic area. Meanwhile, uh, policymakers need data to monitoring SDGs and, pol and policy making, such as uh, when they plan to move the new capital to other cities and to other province, they need uh, to make a master plan. So uh, they need data and mobile positioning data is used for this one, for uh, to make the master plan. And then society need the trusted data. So mobile positioning data will provide uh, qualified trusted statistic indicators, which is more granular, frequent, and timely for monitoring SDGs and other purpose. Because uh, in Indonesia, the SDGs will be monitoring every year. And then that's uh, need the support from sub-national, which is from municipality and also from provincial uh, to, op to achieve the target. The benefit of using mobile positioning data with mobile data is used to increase the coverage and the data quality. And then we can get more frequent data like for the commuting. So uh, we can, uh, because we can get the uh, monthly data, then uh, annual data for monitoring can be obtained. And then also uh, less work and respondent burden because uh, before we have uh, about three household survey, but now uh, at least uh, two household survey is uh, disappear. And cost effective because uh, less budget compared to survey for the mobile processing data because the transportation cost of survey in Indonesia is quite uh, expensive, especially in the area where there is uh, no regular transport. And we also can get more granular data because from survey, we can only like uh, get national data, but with mobile processing data, we can get uh, up to municipality and even sub-district data for commuting. And we can get uh, more timely data also because with uh, survey, the processing often need uh, about uh, six months up to one year. And less manual labor, we didn't need to hire enumerators. So this is uh, our data science teams. Uh, so these uh, nine scientists can handle the workload that uh, usually need about 8,000 enumerators for each quarter on domestic tourism household survey and about 500 enumerators on commuter household survey. And uh, we produce uh, a handbook that uh, in contains quality assurance, sounds methodology, and price versus processing processing. Uh, the quality assurance in the handbook is in line with the uh, BPS uh, quality assurance framework that we developed for census, survey, and administrative data. And the uh, methodology is uh, already standard. Uh, and uh, privacy processing processing also, uh, because uh, we didn't produce uh, the individual data, we published the uh, aggregate data. And when our uh, data scientists access the data, they already uh, mask uh, the subscriber number. And what is important uh, is the key part of an engagement in using mobile processing for using mobile processing data. So we partnered with Ministry of uh, Tourism, Ministry of uh, Planning, and then uh, also with the private sector 
that is a mobile network operator and in engagement uh, there also president degree for SDGs and uh, one map policy and data policy the map is uh, so now our uh, telco also use uh, BPS uh, map and we also build collaboration with the private companies uh, the MNO and uh, Possessium and also uh, develop the data forum which uh, consists of the multidisciplinary expert expertise. I would also like to tell about the UN uh, Global Working Group APD, the subgroup of tourism. It consists of uh, various uh, countries that uh, have experience in using mobile processing data. That is uh, CBS Statistics Netherlands, Geostat Statistics Georgia, Istat Statistics at Italy, Saudi Arabia Statistics, and there also Eurostat, uh, Possessium, UNSG, and ITU. Indonesia is a lead uh, subgroup. In this group, we gather experience of all FAFSTI members, then also develop the second handbook tourism and create a learning material. The handbook and the learning material now is in progress. We will finish maybe uh, late this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Titi, for that very interesting work and presentation. So while we are now with our second presentation, I would like to ask again uh, our colleagues to play the presentation of Mr. Darmokli, please. Okay, so while uh, our colleagues are sharing the presentation, if we can maybe comment a bit on the presentation that was shared by Indonesia. Uh, I think this is a really a great experience. BPS Indonesia has been working on, uh, on this area with other agencies as well. And I think the experience that I ha they have gained in, in this work will benefit other countries who wants to explore big data for the same type of statistics. So now I can see the slides are, are on. So Mr. Lee, if you want to start your presentation. Please. Hello, this is Lee Tomo. I work for SK Telecom, which... Hello, this is Lee Tomo. I work for SK Telecom which has a market share of about 50% in Korea. I am in charge of creating statistical data such as demographics using mobile data. It's an honor to introduce information related to the use of mobile data in Korea. I will introduce three areas of mobile data use cases and web services. And finally, I will share and close our concerns about what is population data. Next. People counting and convergence of data. SKT has been using mobile data to create floating population information since 2010. The left screen represents SKT's market share in the telecommunication market. It's a favorite tourist destination in Korea. Tunis. SKT creates floating population data using SKT's number of customers and estimates the total floating population by reflecting the market share. Using the result, regions with low market share are identified and used for marketing. The screen on the right is the result of analyzing which area require more parking space. It is created by combining navigation data of private companies, parking space data for each building of local government, and public parking lot data. Next. There have been three outbreaks of group inflection in Korea. This is the result of analyzing the 
decrease in population migration caused by the COVID-19. The blue line is 2019 and the orange line below is 2020. February 20, group inflection, reduced population movement by 30%. Next. After that, the population movement volume recovered rapidly for about two months until the end of April. Next. At the end of April, a large scale secondary inflection occurred mainly among young people in their 20s. Next. But the effect of the outbreak in May to August were not seen. Maybe feeling fatigued from the continued mass infection. Two weeks ago, a third group infection has occurred, reduced population movement by 12%. And the next data will be automatic, uh, automatically extracted tomorrow. Next. Web service population movement between regions. Statics Korea and SKTS launched a data service for population movement between regions. Data is also provided, provided to several domestic universities, research labs, and foreign research labs, such as University of Chicago, UC San Diego, and the National University of Singapore. In September, additional analysis Result will be added on the characteristic of summer vacation and visits to the major commercial district. Next. Traffic. Korea Traffic Institute conduct comparison work with National Transport DB and mobile database origin destination data. The left side is the result. Coloration coefficient is over 0.9. Advantages of mobile data is cost saving, moving between small areas, segmentation by general and age, and etc. In 2021, it was decided to use SKT's communication data for the National Transport DB survey project. Next. Real time service every five minutes. SKT operates a nationwide floating population service that is produced every five minutes. Next. On the left screen, you can see the floating population density. And on the right, you can see the growth rate based on the last three hours. Next. And you can select and view the desired gender and age. Next. If you select a specific area, you can see 24-hour trend line and gender and age composition ratio in the area. Next. The police said the number of emergency dispatch requests decreased by 15% compared to the previous year after the real-time services. Next. Question, what is population? I'm doing this work. I asked myself the question, what is population? I think we can create some population data like below. First, classification, resident population, daytime population, and visitor. And concept, first, service population. It is de facto, all people in area. Second, potential customer. Generates an active signal and include, uh, excluding people moving past. It is the potential customer for commercial area. And the third is traveler traffic population. It is stayed more than 30 minutes in some areas. The second is real time. What is real time? I think real time is enough time for understanding and action to an event. So real-time time data is quasi real-time population DB, like every five minutes, I think. Third attribute. We can know about the gender, age, building address, and real residence, place of work, time of type of housing, income, media, spending, and etc. of an individual customer. In addition, we can know your preferences or hobbies through app or web usage records, and know your interests through the place you visit. In Korea, 
attempts are being made to use the data in establishing a strategy to revitalize tourism in the era of COVID-19. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for that uh, experience sharing of the uses of mobile phone data in Korea. We have seen that there are a number of uh, areas where mobile phone data could be used, and you also highlighted the need for definitions. I think that's an, a, a very important issue that, that you raised. So I can see from the chat that there's a number of questions already from our participants. I would like to ask Latifa to read those questions addressed to either Titi or Mr. Lee. Latifa, please. Hello, everyone. So we have uh, various questions coming in. The first question is for Mr. Lee. How do you get gender data and age from mobile data? Another question coming in. Please let us know the definition of movers in terms of ge geographical boundary and time to stay in that boundary. Moving okay. over to Ms. Uh, Titi, we have a couple of questions coming in. The first question, does mobile telecom company are forced to provide data in Indonesia? And for the second question, do you face any resistance collecting mobile data? And how do you retain um, people working in this field? Thank you so much. Thank you, Latifa. So if I can ask Titi first to address the questions. Titi, please. Thank you very much, uh, Latifa. And uh, thank you for the participant for the questions. Uh, my, my first answer, is a uh, under MNO force uh, actually is not uh, is not force but uh, we talk uh, we have a kind of like a long talk um, maybe about uh, six months before because like before they didn't uh, save the data uh, because we are signaling data before they didn't uh, save the data so uh, we asked them to save the data first. And then we have a uh, discussion about uh, six months to um, any resistance. Uh, when we start uh, using uh, mobile phone data in the first release, we explain that uh, we use uh, mobile processing data because previously we use the survey. We wait uh, at the border like uh, for a month uh, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, and then we distribute the data for the, the whole year. So um, for the first time, we explained that we use that another uh, data source. Uh, and then we also uh, mentioned uh, which country that uh, already used that for the, uh, like Estonia, at the time we said that Estonia already uh, used that. And uh, how we uh, get uh, our data scientists uh, actually, we are kind of lucky because uh, we have uh, Institute of Statistics, uh, which uh, produce around uh, 500 uh, people every year, and uh, they study uh, statistics, economics, economic statistics, uh, social statistics, and uh, computing statistics and data scientists. So uh, our data scientists is uh, all our graduates from them. And uh, yeah, uh, actually, um, at first they didn't know what animal is uh, mobile phone data. They know, but uh, what is look like. But then after they go to the uh, MNO, the telco, then they know that the type of the data, and then they learn from them. And then uh, they have training also. That's uh, my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Titi. If I can ask Mr. Lee to address the two questions. Uh, Please, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, if I can ask you to answer the questions, please. Yes, okay. We use signal data and we estimate the floating population in units over 50 meters based on the data found at each base station. 
estimation is carried out using POI, POI is point of interest data, such as the trans transportation facilities, buildings, and major facilities. If 100 customers are identified at a uh, base station, a certain percentage of them will be near transportation facilities, and a certain percentage and a certain percentage will be in an office cluster. We are using a regression analysis model that estimates the number of population every 50 meter using POI information. The verification uses tourist destination data that can count the number of people. In addition, the data identified by the CCTV are used to the result of actual surveys of the floating population are used. Used. This is possible because uh, SKT understands the coverage of each base station in units of 50 meter for 3G and 20 meter for 4G or 5G. I think that the floating population data of 50 meter has an error, error of about 10%. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. So I see that there are no more questions for the two speakers. So I would like to maybe ask Titi uh, a question related to the experience that you have in Indo Indonesia. So we know that BPS Indonesia works on collection, official data collection, such as household survey. So how do you use the results of the household surveys uh, with regards to verifying quality and integrity of mobile phone data? Uh, thank you, SP, for the question. Um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, when cali calibrating the mobile phone data, we are not only use uh, household survey, but we also uh, use other uh, data like uh, immigration data and uh, like uh, transport transportation, like uh, from the railway. Uh, uh, yeah, the railway data. Uh, yeah. Uh, we use, uh, we combine, like for domestic tourism, uh, we combine, uh, I mean, we take first um, the data that uh, we got from the mobile phone uh, data and then compare with our uh, result. But that's uh, already after uh, inference, after uh, we estimate both. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, we see that uh, the result is... Uh, Makes sense. I mean, like uh, reasonable. Then, and then for immigration, like for the outbound, uh, outbound tourism, we use immigration data. Uh, and then, but because uh, in the past we use survey at the border, then uh, now we use uh, mobile phone uh, to replace that uh, survey. In the outbound, uh, the mobile positioning data also used to get the uh, country uh, the of destination because uh, using uh, immigration, we cannot get the uh, country of destination. And also with the, for the inbound data, that's also for the coverage that we previously did with the survey uh, at the border. Like uh, maybe IMF call it uh, subtle trade board, uh, survey or something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Titi. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for, for your answers. We would like to move on to the next two speakers. Uh, Mr. Lee and Titi, please stay on. We will be connecting with you again after the last two presentations. For now, we would like to ask Mr. Erwin Kippenberg. Mr. Kippenberg is the economist from the World Bank. He will be sharing with us an experience that they have uh, related to the work which they are uh, undertaking with the University of Tokyo. Erwin, you have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you, Esperanza, and, and thank you uh, for this, this opportunity. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I am going to, my name is Erwin Knippenberg. I'm a young professional economist at the World Bank working in the poverty team uh, and we would like to talk a little bit about a collaborative effort we've done with the University of Tokyo to explore how we can leverage CDR data in the context of a developing country, specifically the Gambia, to inform some, some policy decisions. 
So first, a little context about the Gambia. Gambia is a country with a large percent of um, immigrants, and uh, therefore we started this conversation with the insight that CDR data analysis could inform the discussion on mobility and urban development. Um, one in three households is an international migrant, yet it remains unclear how this migration and emergencies might evolve over time and how these patterns might differ across the country. We do know that between different parts of the country, different uh, shares of the population report being migrants. So there is a large variation. And we do know that a large number of migrants, there are both a large number of migrants who migrate from up river to the main city, which is on the coast, and a large number of migrants who live abroad. And in terms of the broader uh, UN SDG agenda, this fits into indicators around both migration, but also indicators on urbanization and rural urban patterns, and particularly a better understanding the pattern of people moving into peri-urban areas and uh, potentially slums as rapid urbanization continues to progress in sub-Saharan Africa. With that in mind, what we really wanted to do was rather than a one-off where we went in and we acquired the data directly through a telecom operator and then analyzed it on our own as researchers, we wanted to develop a collaborative partnership with the government and particularly with the regulator uh, in the Gambia, as well as the National Statistics Agency. The idea there being that we first started with a workshop to highlight the, uh, what was possible, what the technical capacity was. We then engaged in capacity building for the data controller, the regulator to establish a system whereby they could expand their existing uh, capacity to acquire CDR data through the MNO operators and then analyze that data. So really the idea was to build a data pipeline from the MNOs originally through the regulator to the researchers and analysts so that at every point the data was owned by the government, the analysis informed the government priorities, and this was a sustainable process that could be continued after this project wound down. Uh, this is the, the contributing team. Uh, a lot of people contributed to this effort. Uh, I mentioned already the regulator, Pura, the National Statistics Agency of Gambia, GBOS, the University of Tokyo, which provided a lot of the technical inputs, the World Bank as a conveyor, as a congregator, brought a lot of these actors together and provided some of the necessary uh, financing. We also worked closely with other government ministries and agencies, including the Ministry of Health, uh, in order to inform their national priorities, as well as with development partners, notably um, UN, UNHCR and the EU have expressed interest in this, this agenda. And um, should you have additional questions about this project or our work, I please, I encourage you to reach out uh, to me and to my colleague, Mr. Moritz Mayer. The, to give you the context in the Gambia, we approached two of the four MNO operators, which together represent about two thirds of the market share in the Gambia, uh, Afrocell and Comium. Uh, the penetration rate in the Gambia is very high with a large number of subscribers that is actually much higher than the total number of people in the Gambia, which tells to us that many people have multiple SIM cards. And so this high penetration rate makes us confident that we can effectively, by tracking uh, CDR data, can track population movement patterns. Uh, indeed, we see that uh, we have a large number of unique users in our data set. Uh, these unique users doesn't vary that much across the study period. And the reason that is important is that the study period overlaps with the onset of COVID. And so we wanted to make sure that as we studied movement patterns and how those movement patterns evolved over time, we weren't being, the data wasn't being biased by a sudden decrease in the number of unique users due to COVID. And as we see, those number of unique users are quite stable. The um, with that in mind, so we wanted to validate 
seeing that we had a stable population, a stable number of unique users, we want to validate whether that stable number corresponded with our population density estimates. So we used a log log uh, regression to establish a linear correlation between ward and count and district level population estimates from two different sources and what the density according to the number of unique users told us. And we found a very strong correlation, both in significance and in magnitude, using two different sources, both WorldPOP, which is from 2019, and the, 2000, the latest census, which was from 2013. And so those made us relatively confident that by tracking the shift in density in unique users across time, we were actually tracking real population movement patterns. Now, of course, there are caveats in terms of how representative those people are in terms of gender and demographics, and I'm happy to talk about some of those caveats. But generally, this proof, this gave us confidence that we could proceed in analyzing population movement dynamics. So the timeline of the analysis, as it happened, overlapped with COVID. So we started by using as a baseline the first two weeks of March, where the COVID lockdowns had not yet been put in place in the Gambia. And then we compare that to a series to every week afterwards for the next three months, where we see the restrictions being put in place, the state of emergency, the closure of borders. But we also, and we'll see this in the data, we also see the onset of Ramadan, which actually leads, since Gambia is a Muslim country, actually leads to an increase, a temporary increase in mobility. So with that in mind, here's a, a snapshot of the analysis we did where you see um, the population movement patterns. So in the, in the west, on the far left is the urban center of the Gambia, Banjul and Serakunda, which are on the coast. And you'll see that pre-COVID, those were areas where a lot of people tended to move towards. Um, that way we had a positive inflow. As the lockdown is put in place, you see those colors shift from green to purple, suggesting that the inflow goes from being net positive to being net negative, and people are actually fleeing the, the coast and the urban areas and going back to their home areas um, to live through the lockdown. And then throughout the country, we're seeing a shift and we're seeing the whole country basically go from green, which suggests a lot of movement and a lot of back and forth, to purple, which suggests a lot of people are in lockdown. The one exception to that is, as I mentioned, during Ramadan, where we see a burst of activity as people move around, uh, and we hypothesize that is to rejoin different family, to rejoin family members and celebrate the beginning of Ramadan together. Then towards the end of our study period, May 24th to 30th, we then see a resumption in activity and gradually we see the, tr the underlying migration patterns take over as people shift back to the urban areas as people shift back to um, Serakunda and Banjul. We also disaggregated this data by the poverty quintile of the poverty rate in each of these wards and found that the highest level of decrease in movement was in the poorest wards, which suggests that truly the poorest areas were the ones most affected by the lockdown and by the pandemic. And I'm happy to talk about that further. So this was our first case study, which came about because of COVID. Our second case study uh, was linked specifically to migration. So this is from data that predates COVID. So it's not affected by the change in migration patterns due to COVID. But what we found here is when we looked at the share of international calls that were incoming to uh, specific cell phone towers as a proportion of the total number of cars calls, this actually matches quite closely with an existing survey we made, we did of households, of the percent of households that had a migrant in their in their household, and what this tells us is when we know is that we can use CDR data not only to track population movement patterns, but also to understand which areas are hotspots for migration, which areas are places where a lot of migrants are coming from, they're leaving home, and then they're calling back home to talk to their loved ones. And we can then see how those patterns shift in, react, in reaction to some outside event, be that conflict, be that drought, be that an economic shock. So we can really use CDR data to track migration patterns in real time. 
And with that, um, I look forward to your questions and, and thank you again for this, this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erwin. I think you had highlighted two important points there that I pick up. One is the importance of coordination and cooperation with the different stakeholders in the country in implementing this project, as well as the importance of checking um, definitions and ensuring that they uh, coincide with existing official statistics. So with that, I would like to move to our next presenter, Mr. May Offermans. Mr. Offermans is the creative and innovator at Statistics Netherlands, who specializes in mobile phone data and public transport data for official statistics. Mr. Offermans, the floor is yours. Thank you very much to, uh, and uh, for the opportunity to speak here at this uh, conference. I'm going to switch to the video now, uh, to the presentation now. See if it's working now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, at uh, Statistics Netherlands, we are working <coughs> on using mobile phone data and we're doing uh, research for several years. And we have a lot of experience in, in working with mobile phone data. And the reason uh, why is that we uh, um, have all kind of changes in society. So we have the platform economy, which makes uh, tourism very difficult because we had uh, a lot of tax registrations we could use uh, to measure that. But uh, because of new developments there, we have, uh, we, we, yeah, there is a need for, for new type of data. And um, so we're just looking at the, uh, at the, um, we're doing research for just for the application. So we haven't implemented uh, anything yet. And we see the same development in other European countries like Germany, Italy, Belgium, and, and France. Some practical challenges with uh, working with this kind of data is of course data access. In the Netherlands, we have three operators. Uh, another issue is um, um, dealing with privacy authority and, and public relations. This data source is really new. People have the idea that and the, and the perception that they are actually being tracked down, which is not the case. We're just counting people, so that's a big difference. But it's very difficult uh, to explain that to to the public. So uh, yeah, getting to to privacy, um, it's uh, yeah, of course it, you need to do a lot about that. So the first thing we we do we do no connections on a personal uh, uh, level or any tracking. We do not uh, interconnected type of data with registrations just to make sure that privacy is really uh, uh, guaranteed. So we make counts based on anonymous, uh, anonymous analysis. Uh, we connect all the data on a meso and macro level and on space and time. So um, we're not doing this on a micro level and everything uh, on output is based on uh, 100 meter tiles. So this is a new way of uh, uh, handling with data on a very low level. Uh, the technical challenges, of course, are geo geolocation determination, uh, determine who is a resident and who is a, um, a guest in a certain area. It's a large data set. You need um, fast processing uh, facilities and uh, you have to implement everything at the operator. So here uh, I want to show you some examples. Uh, this one is, of course, before COVID. So this is the King's Day in Amsterdam. It's uh, usually uh, when there's no COVID, uh, 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 there are many crowds. And Amsterdam is a really old city um, and, and they want to have crowd management system. They want to know how many people are there. So we did some uh, pilots there. So there we uh, determined uh, how many people are there and where are they coming from. So we made a nice origin destination queue. So uh, if you go to our website, you can find more uh, results and, and look at the article. And what we discovered actually that on these events, uh, it's not that crowded as on a normal working day. 
So uh, on and off, but the difference is mostly the behavior of the people. People are outside and not inside. So this gives you new insights on, on how crowds behave and uh, the number of people visiting. So this is more a standard representation. We always have these fancy uh, infographics, but you can also just make a chart like this. So this is the estimated population. Uh, on the 13th March of 2013, this is an old, old example. So it shows actually the number of people in Amsterdam in green that left the municipality. In blue are the people who are living in the municipality and, and staying there at that time. Uh, in pink, you see the people who are, or red, depends on your screen. Um, you see the people visiting Amsterdam. And in purple, you see the tourists actually being there at that uh, time. And the black dot you see in this uh, image is the number of people according to the census. So this gives you a real time de facto population uh, estimates, just as the uh, Korean colleagues uh, showed you uh, the same kind of example. If you go to our website and you type in this link, I will put it in also into the chat box so you can uh, copy it. And there you, can, uh, yeah, there you can see an example of last year about data and population, about estimates of incoming people and outgoing people into the regions of the, of the Netherlands. And it gives you very high detailed uh, information, which is of course anonymous uh, and with respect to privacy. Um, it shows also a longitudinal, longitudinal view of every area. So you can have a view on uh, how many people are there and what is there the pattern. So you can see if it's a, a place with a lot of... Um, um, uh, so there you can see that actually, in this case, you can see The Hague and you can see all the, the patterns of Monday, Tuesday and the weekend. Um, so. In this uh, example, uh, we also have an, uh, a view of tourism coming from the east of Europe. So, uh, and there we have a problem because are there commuters or are there tourists? So we have a lot of people from Eastern Europe that are coming to work uh, on, the, on the countryside or in, in big cities, but also they are staying there as a tourist. So there we are now working with uh, machine learning technology uh, to make sure um, that there is a classification of people between, uh, to make a difference between commuting or uh, tourists, uh, people who are uh, roaming in the Netherlands. And this is also in the, in the first research stage. So um, it's quite difficult to do it, but we did it for a few uh, cities and this uh, seems to work. So this is uh, promising research. It's not published yet. But also you can look at the point of entry. So here we have an analysis in 2013 of uh, a football match. And here you can see the people who are getting in by, uh, into Amsterdam and also the people who are uh, taking the plane and, and leaving again with the plane from Port in this case from Portugal, who uh, went visiting the, the football match. You can also see the people going by car. Um, so, uh, so, so also the point of entry can be very interesting uh, for using roaming data in, in tourism. So the conclusion that of our research is actually that mobile phone data are extremely privacy sensitive. We got a lot of reactions from the public about using these data. Uh, we are using state-of-the-art methods. Um, uh, and our conclusion is that they actually can be used in a very responsible way for uh, official statistics. But um, we're still waiting until, uh, for the public opinion to, to change and uh, to see how things are happening. So until now, nothing has been implemented into official official statistics. We're still working on uh, improvements, especially on validation. Uh, we're also working on new quality frameworks, just that's normal for, for other statistics. And of course, we're looking for international collaboration and standardization, especially with position flow mine and Eurostat, but also of course, with all the other parties we mentioned and seeing today in, the, in our session. And uh, we're now in the process of discussing and explaining and, and being transparent about uh, privacy. So what are the main problems and opportunities? I think the most important one is to keep momentum. So I think it's very difficult to solve all the privacy, technical and quality uh, challenges, and it takes a lot of energy and expertise. And I think this, this limits uh, a lot of progress in, in development programs. 
So uh, what you see in practice is that not much energy is left anymore for documentation and publication of methods. Uh, the perceived risk limits also data access. So people are, data access is still a, a big challenge for everyone, but that can cause projects to fail. So, uh, and another problem is also that it's, it's quite difficult. It requires high investments on tools and, and expertise. So, so these are opportunities we're all facing. So that makes my final message. I think it's very uh, important to collaborate and um, to obtain a, a reliability and trust from the public and, and explain all the methods uh, we're working with. So uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, keeping it short considering the, the, the problem of the time. So this is my, uh, was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, May, for that wonderful uh, presentation and experience sharing. So I took it that there are, of course, aside from the, the good things that we know about mobile phone data, there are issues or, or challenges that can be faced when analyzing mobile phone data. And you named a few partly um, data access, the infrastructure that's necessary to contain all the data and the processing time that's involved. You also highlighted the skills that's necessary for those data to be um, analyzed and, and utilized. So I think that's a, a point that I think we should be talking after in terms of uh, the questions that could be raised in our chat. So I would like now to ask Irki to read the questions that we have received from our participants. Irki, please. Irki, you're muted. Thank you, Esperanza. So uh, I'd uh, like to start off uh, with a question both for May and Irvin. So, and the question is that uh, you both presented and actually the previous uh, presenters as well, that uh, there's a great potential in using mobile phone data uh, for different kind of statistics. Uh, we have had the data, uh, well, depending on the country, but on uh, quite a good level for over a decade, for sure. So why it hasn't been widely used yet? What has been the main issue? So May, maybe you can start and then Irvin. Well, especially now during COVID, uh, this data source is really interesting, but that also makes people very uh, Cautious. It's, these are very anxious times. People, they are all kind of conspiracy theories. And then there's the government coming up with this solution, which seems to work. So there are a lot of questions about this. And there's also the privacy authority, and they want to prove that they are actually looking very right, very correct to, to civil rights, which is, of course, their important role. And uh, these discussions uh, slow down also the, the, the implementation. So actually, we are waiting on an approval for, from the privacy authority to continue uh, with publishing these results. And also, we have to explain that the results are actually really anonymous, that they can't be hacked by, uh, by other people who are trying to combine it with Google data or whatever. So what we did is we, we provided some extra research, which of course takes time to actually prove on a mathematical way that the, the data you could publish that they are really anonymous. So there are no interlinks, so there are no connections anymore possible. So that was also first new research again, but I think that's very good to do it. And actually it proved that we are right. So now we end the dis discussion. We also finished all the documentation and now everything goes to parliament. So parliament will decide if we are allowed to do this. And the, the real legal issue is also that legislation is quite old and uh, not used to this type of data. So that makes it also not really clear if you are allowed to, to use this type of data. We think we are allowed, but uh, other people think different. So there is some kind of vagueness uh, in law. And then there's this sensitive thing that people are being tracked down. So people think these are GPS data. They are being tracked down uh, on an individual level, which is not the case. So we just count them on, a, on an aggregated level. And uh, it's very difficult to, to change this into the minds of people that we're making statistics and not tracking them uh, individual. So these discussions are now taking place in public and press and, um, and, and yeah, that, that's slowing us down now for uh, implementing it. Okay, thanks. So Erwin, 
uh, what about you? What do you think? Why it has been kind of taking time to use the statistics and and then uh, what have been the main problem in your work that you uh, what you've done uh, to do take the statistics forward? So I, I completely agree with with uh, Mr. Offerman's uh, point that data confidentially confidentiality privacy concerns are, are paramount and that those need to be addressed uh, right off the bat, uh, that, which is where it's key to engage directly with governments and with regulators to make sure there is an understanding, there is ownership, and there is a, a political will, whether that goes through parliament or through a government decision, another government decision-making process, there is a, a ownership to, to go forward with this sort of analysis uh, I think in addition, at least in, in our context, working in developing countries, there is often a technical capacity gap to bring this, you know, this is sophisticated data and in order to analyze it properly, in order to ensure it is properly encrypted, properly an anonymized, um, used and available in such a way as to not be, be re-identified, as uh, Mr. Offerman's pointed out, that takes a certain amount of training and that takes a certain amount of capacity that needs to be built up. So one thing we're doing at the World Bank and, and multiple teams are working on this is to start drawing up so that we don't constantly have to reinvent the wheel because having worked in multiple countries, we often tend to run into some of these same issues is to draw up some of these standard operating procedures, which includes both legal documents, data sharing agreements, where we can work directly with the governments in such a way that they are comfortable with working with, with sharing this data with us, knowing that these concerns have been addressed and also providing this technical capacity building that involves both training, potentially the provision of or support in acquiring the necessary hardware, and therefore essentially streamlining this process so we can draw from a lot of these data, these lessons learned in the past 10 years, as this has moved from purely sort of a, a research proof of concept to really being useful and informative to policymaking. And I think in many ways, the COVID pandemic has accelerated this process because it has demonstrated the usefulness of this data in, uh, in a public health context. And in many ways, uh, the countries that have gone the furthest are the countries that had already started laying the groundwork to have these conversations, because these are conversations that can't happen when you need the data. These are conversations that need to happen months, if not years in advance, that when the data becomes, when you really need the data, You've laid you've laid out all the necessary legal and technical groundwork. So thanks for both of you. I totally agree. So it just uh, really uh, is the time to put into the these discussions on uh, legal and technical uh, side uh, that needs to be uh, made happen. So I totally agree as well that the COVID situation is uh, changing. So now to the questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Irvin, we have two questions for you, uh, two technical questions. So the first one is, uh, how does the market share can be used as a var variable uh, to correct the just uh, coverage issues? So you used the uh, market share uh, and uh, how did you correct the just the coverage issues in Gambia? Uh, so as of now, so you, you can potentially use market share to, to weigh the um, CDR data to, to weigh proportionally. That requires an assumption that the market share is equally distributed across the entire country. We know from our conversations with the distributors that that might be an overly simplistic assumption that some of the, the, uh, reg, the uh, agencies might be more present in rural areas versus urban areas. So we are working with them to use the market share to then reweigh our analysis and, um, and therefore adjust accordingly using proportionate uh, market share weights. I will note that one of the advantages of working with directly with the regulator rather than through the MNOs is that in principle, the regulator has made a decision, and this goes back to the uh, importance of getting regulatory buy-in, that this is necessary data as determined by the Gambian government and therefore that all MNO operators are in principle um, obliged to comply with these data provision requirements. We've only been able to analyze two of the four because given the urgent nature of this analysis, they were the ones who were able to provide the data in time. 
But in principle, again, working through the regulator, we should be able to have full compliance from all four uh, data, uh, MNO operators. And that to us is an advantage of working through the government rather than working directly with a single MNO operator. Thanks. And another technical one is what is the definition for unique users in your analysis? So we use IMEIs, which are the unique IDs assigned to every um, SIM card. And therefore, so every SIM, which is why, as you see, we have more SIM cards than uh, people in the country, because the idea is multiple people have, can often have multiple SIM cards. Often they play different between different MNO operators. So when we use, say, unique users, we say unique IMEIs. Okay, thanks. So turn to uh, May. A question for you, how do you, and that was actually my question as well, how do you validate the results of machine learning algorithms? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, there are several methods and there's always validation. There's not always one method to do it. So uh, the first thing we are doing is simply uh, look at the data and have some kind of face validity uh, test. Just looking at, okay, what is happening? How is the classification working on a very local level? So, so just one city. So you can use simulated data uh, uh, first and to, to, to test the algorithms. So you have a simulation and saying, okay, this is really a student. This should be a pattern of a, a tourist. So this should be a pattern of the commuter. And then you can test the algorithm. So this is the first design test. And then you can test it on, uh, in, on real data in practice. And then we have the advantage to have some kind of registrational data uh, which is not always uh, the, the very best, but it gives a good indication because the commuters, they pay tax in the Netherlands. So we have tax registrations uh, on the commuters. And uh, for tourists, um, there we have the, the normal tourism statistics, which are also based on registrations in hotels and, and, uh, uh, and other official uh, economies, knowing that there is, an, of course, an underestimate in the official uh, uh, tourism numbers because a lot of people are using new platforms like Airbnb. So these are the way uh, to do it. Uh, so I think the most powerful one is to, to use synthetic data based on, a, on, on okay, what could be a normal commuter, what could be a normal uh, student or, or tourist. But yeah. Yeah, so actually finding the ground truth data is very hard, right? Uh, for the training. <laughs> There, there is another one I forgot to tell. So there is another one, and that's using um, informed consent of certain people and then have an own panel. So you create your own control panel, your own control group. Uh, of these people, you know everything. So we're also trying to set up a panel for that. Yeah, yeah good. So and uh, the last question uh, just came in, uh, and this is for both of you. Uh, so starting with you, May. So the question is, do you think big data can be relied upon to provide information or build decisions and plans as is the case with statistics? So meaning the official statistics most probably. So what do you think, big data, is it reliable? Uh, I think it's always a combination. So I think there should be some uh, a good combination between uh, survey data, um, a, a local data, uh, uh, so that could would be the best, but if if it's um, if you have tested enough, validated enough, if there's a quality framework, yeah, of course you can use it. And I think in Estonia is actually proven that you can use it for uh, official tourism statistics. So there, that's one of the examples. And Indonesia, it's the same. So there, and, and also I saw a very nice uh, uh, presentation of COSTAT for data and population or de facto population. So that actually proves that you can make uh, official statistics out of it. Thank you. And, uh, can we ask Irvin as well? Okay. Yes, please. So, so Irvin, what do you think? I completely agree. I think it's important to triangulate between official um, survey data, which is what we traditionally rely on, and these, these new sources of data. I think every data source has its pros and cons, its advantages and disadvantages. And by putting them together in, uh, in different ways and, and trying to innovate, we can get at better insights. Um, you know, we've demonstrated throughout multiple of these presentations that you can use traditional survey data to then ground truth to validate 
big data, and then the big data offers you both scale and higher temporal and spatial resolution than survey data can necessarily do. So this in no way substitutes for traditional hard, those traditional work of survey data, which remains crucial, but in many ways complements it and enhances it. Thank you. Thank you. So back to you, Esperanza. Thank you very much, Erki. Thank you uh, to Erwin and to May for those wonderful answers. I'm conscious of the time. We have two minutes left. It's get, getting late in Korea, so I will now conclude. Um, from this session, we have seen several examples that showcases the potential of mobile phone data in addressing the data gaps, specifically for the SDG indicators. There are challenges in front of us, including data privacy, access to data, data governance, interoperability, lack of capacity or skills, lack of or issues related to infrastructure to host this data. And all of this could be uh, mitigated by um, working together and involving different stakeholders in the country. We have seen that cooperation and coordination in these examples that we have seen in the presentations uh, that we have uh, shown today has proven positive in terms of mitigating these um, challenges. It is important that the different agencies such as the ministries, the regulators, the national statistical offices, the operators, of course, academia, universities, private and, and public research institutes and, and data providers work together to uh, help uh, mitigate these challenges. So we hope that these um, experiences are, are very useful to the participants. And we hope also that the work of the task team on mobile phone data could address some of the challenges that we have highlighted today. We hope that by the end of the term of the task team on mobile phone data, we will be able to produce handbooks that will outline some of the methodologies that could be used by countries when analyzing mobile phone data. At the same time, these handbooks, we hope to uh, generate training materials that could be shared by um, the working group or the global working group to countries who may want to replicate the same, the same experience. So with this, I would like to thank everyone for joining the session today. Uh, special thanks to our speakers, Mr. Lee, Titi, Erwin, and May. You had ex shared excellent presentations today, and your answers are uh, to the point and very useful. I also would like to thank, of course, Latifa and Erki, who helped um, answer, uh, moderate the chat sessions. Um, and I would like to mention that this session is also recorded. So if participants wants to check any details from the presentations that were mentioned today, you can go back to the session recording and see the presentations. So with that, I would like to wish everyone good day, take care and all the best. Thank you. <laughs>